Welcome to Motherhood. I'm Dr. Christina Hibbert, here to help you overcome, to become, and to flourish in this interesting experience we call motherhood. Now, today's topic, we are going to be focusing on a specific challenge that many of you out there might be facing with your children, and that is parenting the child with ADHD. Now, we've all heard of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and today we're going to be talking about some of the keys to helping your child and yourself, first of all, get the right diagnosis, understand this disorder, and to teach them the skills that are going to help them to find success down the road and might help you as well as parents. Now, I hope you'll stick around even if you don't have a child with ADHD because, let's face it, chances are that eventually we could end up with a child that has that disorder or diagnosis or we probably know someone who has that diagnosis or we work with a child or a parent or a person who has that diagnosis or we live with them and even if none of those are true for you we are still going to hear some wonderful parenting tips tips to help us with our child's behavior and etc so stick around as we talk with our expert today author and adhd parenting coach cindy goldrich But first, I want to thank you for joining us here each week on Motherhood. It's such a treat to get to spend this time with you. And I hope you have joined us on our Facebook page at Growing Through Motherhood. So ask to be added, look us up, and you can join the group. And we're hoping to keep that group going and growing as we continue on with the show here. Also, you can find us all over social media. Join me on Instagram at Dr. Christy underscore Hibbert. And on Facebook, of course, and everywhere else you are, we are there too, as well as on YouTube where you can find a video of today's show. And finally, I hope you will check out my website where you can find links to all kinds of resources on the kinds of things we'll be talking about today, including great parenting skill ideas and strategies and links to my brand new book, Eight Keys to Mental Health Through Exercise, which has a whole chapter on exercising with your family. And yes, it can help focus and attention and all these things we'll be talking about today. So please check that out as well. That is available now all over the place. And so as I was saying, we're talking about ADHD today. And I used to evaluate for ADHD, I guess. I worked in a in an elementary school as a school counselor for my one of my internships back in graduate school. And of course, I got to do some psychological testing, IQ testing. And of course, sometimes we were trying to uh, figure out if a child had attention deficit disorder or if they had something else going on at home. So I was experienced in that. I knew a lot, quite a bit about the disorder and really didn't think that any of my children had that disorder. Um, Although sometimes you wonder, right? Sometimes you wonder. But it wasn't until just a couple years ago when I was taking a course with the incredible Dr. Daniel Amen. And of course, he is a very well-known, well-respected brain researcher and um, physician. And he was teaching an all-day course on different types of, you know, brain (laughs) health and these kinds of things. And so I was taking this course and he was talking at one point about ADHD. And he showed some scans of brains that had ADHD versus the scans of brains that did not have ADHD. And it was very interesting because not only did it show that certain areas of the brain were more ignited in the brains with ADHD than in other brains, And other areas were more kind of dampened or quieted than others with ADHD. But also one thing that he said that stuck with me, he was talking about medications. And he was talking about how when you truly have ADHD and you get that diagnosis, we don't want to, I think a lot of us parents think we don't want to label our child. We don't want to give them a diagnosis because then they'll have to be on medication forever or they'll have to whatever. But the truth is that what he said really hit me because he said, it's better for us to have a diagnosis if that's what's really going on, because otherwise we're going to maybe have children who are going to be raised feeling like they're just not smart enough or they're lazy or they just aren't as good as the other kids or they're not, quote, normal. So that started me thinking, and I really started to wonder as well if one or maybe two of my children might have a little ADHD as well. And so it really changed my whole perspective on it. And I really hope that today, for those of you who aren't sure what's if that's what might be going on with your child or even with yourself, that you'll listen to what we have to say and take some of this advice and apply it 
to help yourself, to find the right diagnosis and to get the right treatment for you so that you can flourish as we talk about here on the show, right? So I want to introduce our guest for today. She is the author of Eight Keys to Parenting Children with ADHD, which is part of the Eight Keys to Mental Health series through Norton, which is um, my book, Eight Keys to Mental Health through Exercise, is part of as well. So um, Cindy Goldrich, she has authored this book, which is an award-winning book. We're going to talk about the Eight Keys today. Cindy is also an ADHD parenting coach. She helps parents and children with ADHD. She received her master's in counseling psychology from Columbia University, and she also does school support, staff development, and parent presentations, but she really loves coaching, and she does that in person in the New York area, in Long Island, and Manhattan area, or via phone, and she's also the creator of the wonderful program, national program, Calm and Connected Workshop, and this is for parents of children with ADHD, so if you're struggling, you're not sure where to turn, go check out her program because she also has it online. And that is available. You can find out all about Cindy and all her work on ptscoaching.com. That's her website. That's ptscoaching.com. So Cindy, welcome to Motherhood. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here and to get to talk about this topic that is so important. And I know on the minds of so many of our listeners who are moms out there who might be wondering if their child or even maybe themselves might be struggling with some of the things we're talking about today. So let's kind of jump right in and talk about some of the symptoms. You know, what what is ADHD? It used to be called ADD, then it was ADHD, and there's all these different ways of calling it. So explain what it means to have ADHD. Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, as you mentioned, it used to be called ADD. Um, as of, I think, 1997, it's all called ADHD. Even if a child has no hyperactivity at all, they still would have ADHD. So first I'll just say what the categories are and then I'll talk about a little bit of the symptoms. Okay. Okay. Um, there are really three diagnostic um, areas. Either a child has ADHD, in which case they have the hyperactivity and the impulsivity. Um, they could have ADHD inattentive type, in which case they're missing the inattentive, uh, that they are inattentive, they're missing the hyperactive impulsive component, mm-hmm. or they could really be combined, so where they really have a little of everything. Right. All right. right. But in terms of, you know, there are different stages that parents really bring their kids to maybe see if they need a diagnosis of ADHD. Sometimes parents know right off the bat, like really early on, whether the child's in preschool or even not in preschool, when their child is just maybe all over the place can't sit still at all, is really inattentive, is maybe very hyperactive, very impulsive, um, they will bring their child in for, you know, maybe an exam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We want to see what the symptoms are. You have to see some symptoms by, you can see it by about age four for sure, but you do need to see symptoms by age, I believe, 12 to 14. The reason right. that we say that long is actually, do you know how you diagnose an adult with ADHD? How? You have to go back and look at their childhood. Mm-hmm. So if, a, if an adult is wondering, well, gee, this sounds like I may have ADHD, you can't get ADHD later in life. Mm-hmm. It's something mm-hmm. you're born with. It's a neurobiological disorder, right? ADHD, right. Right. the core of it is below normal um, transmission of uh, of dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain's prefrontal cortex. That's the front part of the brain, right? Mm-hmm. Where your executive mm-hmm. functions are, which is what I'll talk about in a few minutes. But so if you want to see if someone has ADHD, you're really going to want to look at a lot of different areas. Their attention, their focus, their hyperactivity, their impulsivity. But beyond that, we also, more importantly, have to see what we want to rule out, Okay. There are things that can make it look like someone has ADHD, such as allergies, uh, you know, severe allergies, Crohn's disease, uh, sleep disorder, um, thyroid condition. These are things we want to make sure, have we ruled these things out? You want to make sure that you're observing the child in two or more settings, okay, because what they show at home may be different than what they show at school. But even if it is different, 
doesn't mean it's not ADHD. It may just be showing up differently in different settings. So, so let's pause right here and kind of break some of this down. So, because you've said a lot of things I want to emphasize for our listeners. So first of all, you talked about the different types of ADHD, you know, inattentive, hyperactive, um, and, and, and combined type with both, right? So really one thing that I would hope you would clarify just a little bit for those listening that might not be sure what the inattentive type looks like. Because I think when we think of ADD, we do think of the hyperactive type and the one that's exactly. out there causing trouble and all that, but it's not necessarily like that. So first of all, what would an inattentive type look like? And then I have a couple of other question, follow-up questions to what you've already said, and then we'll move on to talk sure. more about this. Yeah. Sure. So the inattentive child might be the one that you know, it's just sitting there maybe twirling their hair or playing very quietly or just being, you know, sort of more to themselves. It's not that they don't have the same symptoms internally, though, because actually ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, but it's really a misnomer. It's not a deficit in attention. It's actually a deficit in the ability to regulate your attention. Oh, that's important. So that's important. people with ADHD can pay attention, but not always for enough time or on what they need to, right? Yeah. So yeah. the child that has the inattentive type, they may have a bombardment of thoughts also. In fact, some kids have described it, it's like you're watching TV, but you, you're watching one channel, but you're listening to five channels. Mm -hmm. So for the child that's inattentive, that's really such a poor name for it. It's not that they're inattentive, it's that they're not able to regulate their attention, but they're not being very hyperactive about it. That right, it's more right. internal. Right. So, so yeah. So we don't always see that as being the picture of ADHD. But I loved what she said. It's not a deficit in attention. Right. It's that regulation and where are they putting their attention? Because exactly. a lot of times I understand. You know, kids they'll focus on something that they love for hours, but you know and something that's else all might not. That's called hyperfocus. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, you know, yeah, I have kids that, you know, the parents will say, oh, my kid can play video games for hours or play Legos for hours. That's the same problem. They're not able to regulate their attention. Yeah. And that's why they have trouble with transitions, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, what a transition is, is it's stopping an activity, it's moving toward the next activity, and then it's starting an activity. But you need to regulate your attention to be able to smoothly transition from one thing to another. Right. Okay, that's a great way to put it. And, you know, I, want, I love how in your book you compare ADHD to traffic. Um, yeah. So explain that metaphor for us because I think that's a great way for people to understand a little bit. Sure, sure. It's like imagine in a city there, you know, the streets are going by, right? Uh, the traffic is going by rather on the streets. Mm -hmm. And you've got a traffic cop. But the traffic cop is sleepy, or maybe the traffic light is out of order. So the messages aren't getting from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's happening. There's just so much chaos in the brain. ADHD, and this is a really important thing for parents to realize, ADHD is not a problem of knowing what to do. It's a problem of doing what they know. Mm -hmm. So it's a performance problem. It's not an intellectual problem. You can be incredibly smart and of ADHD, but you look like you're not doing anything. Right, and it's right. the performance that's the problem. Oh, I love that. It's not about, um, what did you say? Not about doing. ADHD is not a problem of knowing what to do. Yes, it's a yes. problem of doing what you know. Doing yep. what you know. So that's, that's a great tip for all you parents out there listening who might be wondering, you know, if this is something that your child might be experiencing or yourself. So that's a really good point, And I appreciate that. And then you were talking about, um, you know, how we make a diagnosis and seeing kids in different settings. And the one one point that you talked about, too, is going back to our history. And I know that the old DSM, which is the manual, the diagnostic manual that we all use, um, it used to have it at, what, seven years old that you had to have symptoms by. And now they've raised that age, which I think is a good thing so that more kids can be identified if it's exactly. not obvious by age seven, is that kind of where that came from? That's exactly it. Because mm -hmm. what we realize is, yeah, you want to give time for some kids. I mean, some kids you can diagnose confidently early on, but some kids you really don't know. Mm -hmm. And by the way, yeah, so you want to be able to look back at the childhood and see, you know, what's really going on. Um, but by the way, the other thing that's really important is you want to make sure 
that you've ruled out, as I said, some of the medical things, but other things that could be going on, maybe incredible family stress, yes. economic yes. situations, health issues, um, if there's tremendous anxiety or depression, mm -hmm. a child may not be performing as, as you would expect them to based on their intellectual level. Right. And I think that's a really important point as well, because a lot of times I think we as parents, we see something going wrong with our child and we do, we look for the quick answer. And if we think it looks like ADHD, then that's what we think it is. But I really appreciate that you're helping us understand the importance of ruling out the physical, the medical side of things, the other mental health conditions that contribute, and then the environmental cues that, that yeah. can, in situations that can cause these types of symptoms. I mean, children who are going through a divorce with their parents can sometimes have these kinds of symptoms and not be able to focus or put their attention where they need to be or might be behind in school. And, and you know, it's not necessarily an ADHD problem. So I really appreciate that, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, so when it comes to getting help, you mentioned um, having an evaluation and how can parents find the right help? And especially if they need to be evaluated in two different settings or, um, right. you know, I know you work in the schools, but not everybody does, right? So, <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I should say, you know, my role is I'm an ADHD parent coach. I don't do the diagnostic work. I don't do the medical ma management, mm -hmm. but I educate and I support. And one thing I always tell my parents is you have to go to the right person to get a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There are different categories of people that can diagnose, right? Like a pediatrician can, a neuropsychologist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist. It's more important that you go to someone who really understands what ADHD is right. than worry about what category of person to go to. Right. That's, that's yes. great advice. Like, like I said at the beginning of the show, I used to do evaluations and sometimes for ADHD. But now I don't really do that anymore, so I wouldn't tell someone to come to me. But, you know, back in the day yeah. when I was doing all the time, when you really are working, oh, I was working in the schools and it was something that I did all the time, then you're right. It's uh, making sure they have that clinical experience to be able to figure out what's going on and that they're staying really current yes because our understanding i mean the new D dsm the dsm-5 came out in 2015 uh 2013 yeah and they again changed you know how we're looking at adhd so it's very important to stay current that's right that's right Good, good point. So what are some of the most common challenges? I mean, I'm sure parents listening right now can easily name off some of the challenges they face with their children that they're trying to parent with ADHD. But what would you say are some of the impacts that we see of ADHD on things like children's behavior and their academics and social skills and relationships and things like this? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to hone in on a few things that people don't necessarily think of initially. Okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. which is sometimes we, uh, these poor kids, we think they're being so defiant and difficult that we don't even realize it's part of the ADHD. Mm -hmm. For instance, you may say, and I know some of the parents out there are probably going to be nodding their heads along with me right now. Johnny, in five minutes, will you come downstairs with your books, your backpack, and your shoes, and on the way down, get my, and these kids aren't doing it. Mm -hmm. And the assumption that we make sometimes is, oh, this kid is just, he doesn't care, he's not trying, he's being defiant, right? Yeah. But in reality, part of what's going on is that he's not able to focus on what you're saying, but more than that, he may have, and you know, we didn't talk about executive functions yet, I know we'll talk about that in a minute, but mm -hmm. he may not be able to hold on to all of those thoughts at one time. That has to do with his working memory, which, mm. by the way, is one of the executive functions. Mm. Um, so he may not be able to hold on to all of those thoughts. The processing speed, he may not be able to kind of take in what you're saying and think about it, hold on to it in his head enough to be able to do what's expected of him. Mm. So whereas we're thinking he's being defiant, in reality, He's just not able to perform what we're asking him to without the additional support. Right. Right. Well, and you're right, because understanding this can help us reframe how we see our children that struggle with this, right? Because right. you're right. They do get labeled a lot. Children with ADHD get labeled as, what, lazy or stupid or, like you say, mm -hmm. don't care, defiant. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. But that's not that's not what's going on in no. this case. Yeah. It's really not. Yeah. It's really not. Well, and let's talk about how parents might label themselves as well. Um, 
you know, I'm sure that there are plenty of parents listening who feel like, well, if my child is having these behaviors of ADHD, then that just means I'm not parenting well enough. You know, that are, I'm sure you run into that. There are parents that feel like, well, I'm just not doing a good enough job, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? To those parents, I say this. Poor parenting cannot and does not cause ADHD. It is a neurobiological disorder. You didn't do it. Yes. <laughs> okay. And I love that. You say that right in your book. I actually highlighted that part because I think that's really important. So say it again. <laughs> yeah. So poor parenting cannot and does not cause ADHD. Yeah. It's a neurobiological disorder. Yeah. Having said that, I wish for the day that when whenever any doctor gives a diagnosis of ADHD, whether or not they prescribe medication, they must prescribe parent education, mm. parent coaching. Because the more we understand about our kids, the more we understand about you know, how their brain works and what impacts behavior, the better we can really match them and help them and not be triggering them and not be triggered by them. You know, One of the things um, about ADHD is the potential to develop oppositional behavior is actually 11 times greater oh, wow. than in kids who don't have ADHD. Mm-hmm. And the reason is, is, in my eyes, a few reasons. One of the main reasons is we don't understand the kids. Mm-hmm. We don't realize that their processing speed may be slower or that their working memory may be weaker. Or one of the other things I'll mention is their sense of time may not be as accurate, mm-hmm. which yeah. is actually yeah. factual. Kids with ADHD, adults with ADHD, don't have as much of an accurate sense of the passage of time. So we take all of these different behaviors our kids have and we assume you know we have some kind of moral judgment about it oh he's not trying he doesn't care but in reality it's just the way his brain is working Mm -hmm. and by the way there's nothing wrong with his brain he's a wonderful kid he can be incredibly bright he just may need a little extra support and every one of those those weaknesses so to speak may be his strength as well but we have to let him know how to work Right. So it's about identifying what's going on with your child and then sort of joining them where they are and understanding them better. And I love what you said about parent education, because, I mean, I think we need to be educated about everything that goes on with our child. But especially when you are dealing with a child who has ADHD, you do need to understand. And, you know, I really appreciated your point about that their brain isn't, you know, wrong. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just it's different. So we need to understand how it works. And I think most of most of us in general, especially as parents, we don't know much about how the brain works. And so it's really important to get that education as parents so that we can help provide the skills then that children need, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's interesting. I, I now train other professionals to be ADHD parent coaches. And in my current training, um, one of the coaches said something I thought was great. ADHD is not a failed version of normal. Oh, I love that. It's ADHD normal. is not a it's failed not version failed. of normal. And that's what we think, isn't it? Right. If you could just be normal. Wow. That's great. That's great. So let's talk about your keys because your keys are the way that parents and children and families can, um, can, can help ADHD, right? So key one is to get educated. Obviously, what we've been talking about has been some of the education, but... Tell us a little bit more about key one, getting educated. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Key one is you've got to understand your child. You've got to know what ADHD is and very closely related to that, what executive functions are. Mm -hmm. Um, Shall I explain what executive functioning a little bit? Go for it. Okay. So executive function is the front part of your brain, which is the last part of your brain to develop. Your brain develops from the back to the front. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the front part of the brain is really, it's your control center. It's where you do what you intend to do. It's known actually as the CEO of the brain, the chief executive officer of the brain. And I like to help parents teach their kids and educators teach their kids about what executive functions are so that they realize that you really are the manager of each of these subsets of your brain. So in terms of the executive functions, I'll, I'll mention what they are. Um, the first one is initiation. Mm. Do you notice that some kids have a hard time just getting started? Just like picking up the pen or starting whatever they need to do. What we need to realize is these are all skills. So just like learning how to read is a skill, 
And if a kid was having a hard time learning how to read, we wouldn't yell at him to just try harder or just, you know, why aren't you doing it? We would give him support. We would would modify, we would give supports, everything else. With the executive function skills, the same thing has to be true. So if a child's having a hard time initiating, saying to the kid, well, come on, just get started. Why don't you get started? That's not a strategy. That's That's actually just repeating an expectation. That's reminding me of like taking a kid that has no desire to play sports or doesn't even like it and saying, just be the star of the basketball team or something like that, right? Exactly. Like, you know, if he could, he would. Right, right. So we want to have some strategies. So for instance, with initiation, if a kid's having a hard time um, initiating, you may want to say, okay, what do you need to do to start your engine? And then help them develop a pattern because so often – you know, if we if we have a routine, it's a lot easier to get started. Mm-hmm. I always say I'm, I'm in New York. I'm a New York Mets fan. We have a, a baseball player named David Wright, and he does the same thing every time he gets up to bat. He adjusts one glove. He adjusts the other glove. He puts the bat out, pulls the bat in, puts it on his shoulder, and now he has signaled his brain, I'm ready to start. Mm, I like that. So I like what that. can you do to help your kid develop a pattern of behavior that tells him it's time to start? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So that's the first executive function. Great. Great. The next one is going to be um, focus, which is you can see where that's related to ADHD. And by the way, the thing I didn't mention, if you have ADHD, you've got deficits in executive functioning. Mm -hmm. You cannot have ADHD without having deficits in executive functioning. You can have deficits in executive functioning without having ADHD, by the way. But the thing is with executive functions, you could be up to 30% delayed in developing your executive function skills. So if you've got, let's say, a fifth grader and you're saying, I don't get it, he's so smart. Why doesn't he pack his backpack properly? Like, why doesn't he do that? He must be, what? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, lazy. <laughs> yeah, right? right? But the thing is, another one of the executive functions is planning and organizing. Mm-hmm. So again, remember, this is a skill. So if he's having a hard time and he might be up to 30% delayed, so even though he's in fifth grade, he may be acting more like a third grader. In that so, way. In that yeah, way. in that way. Right. So right. what do we need to do? We need to supply him with some extra support and tools, strategies, patience, right? Yes. Big time. <laughs> okay. And love. So that's, so that's another one. Um, I mentioned a little bit of working memory. Working memory is your sort of like your, your brain search engine, right? It's how you hold on to information and manipulate the information so you can use it. Kids with ADHD can really have a weaker working memory. So again, we want to support it. How do you support a working memory? Easy. You want to maybe write down what the steps are rather than expecting them to hold on to it in their head. Maybe give them one or two steps at a time, not five or six steps. Yeah. Okay. Right. And, and what you're describing is so important because it's breaking things down and showing kids how to, you know, manage themselves better and how to manage their lives better, just like we all need to do. Just like you teach them to cook or clean or, you know, take care of their bank account or something. You're also yeah. showing them how to ma- regulate their their brain functioning, essentially, because that might be their weakness. Like you said earlier, it's not that there, there's something wrong with their brain, but we all have strengths and weaknesses even when it comes to our brain and this is where their weakness lies. So they're, you're giving them strategies to kind of compensate, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And they're very and, practical. You know, I would say in, in my parent workshop, I have a parent workshop series, um, calm and connected. I always tell parents if they're having an area where they're weaker, don't use shame. Don't use blame. Don't use criticism. Right. You got to yeah. use yeah. tolerance, empathy, and support. Right that's how you're really going to help them move forward. They've it. had enough it. of the no, you're wrong, you can't, right? We need to do right. it they, Well, you're right, because these kids have heard that over and over. And you're right. And they might believe that they're lazy or that they're stupid. And, and that's one reason why I know that... Um, you know, it's recommended often for, for adults who think they might have this to go and get it checked out because, you know, the earlier we can kind of diagnose what's going on, the earlier we can start learning these skills so that we don't develop that sense of self that says I'm lazy, I'm stupid, I'm not good enough in this way. Right. Yeah. So it really is important to get that help and diagnosis and understanding and education as soon as we understand, as soon as we know that there's something going on. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, very closely related to this is the executive function of processing speed. Yeah. 
And processing speed is, to me, one of the greatest of the impacts of ADHD. Because this is an area, and I'll explain what it is, but this is an area where they really can be severely impacted. So your processing speed is your ability, I talked about it a little bit before, but to perceive information and respond to it with, with your speed and accuracy. Mm. So what happens is the teacher says, okay, class, who's the first president of the United States? And kids raise their hand really fast. Well, the kid that may just need a little longer to process, what's he immediately thinking about himself? I'm not as yeah, smart. Yeah, smart as the other kids, right, right, which right. is really shameful because he may be just as smart, if not smarter. In fact, he may have been really thinking like all about that person and, yeah, and really yeah. understand who that first president is and have a whole visual map of who that is. So it took him a little longer to get his hand up. Right. right? right. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I'm so passionate about parent education. We have to understand this. We have to slow down and maybe give ourselves, our kids a few extra seconds. So we get educated as parents so then we can educate our children and teach them the skills and get other people involved like yourself, like a coach or, you know, counselor or whoever's going to help you, somebody at the school to teach the children these these methods to help and to help ourselves, those of us who are adults that might struggle, struggle with this as well. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I tell teachers when I do professional development, you know, rather than having the kids, you know, immediately raise their hand, tell everyone, okay, in five seconds, I'm going to ask everyone to raise your hand. Oh, and then everyone oh, gets to raise their hand together. Yeah, what a great idea. What a great idea. And you know, that, that point about processing speed, you're reminding me of my days when I used to do a lot of IQ testing. And that is a whole subset of IQ testing is processing right. speed. And I remember so many kids who would um, be just brilliant in these other areas. And then they'd have, you know, like this huge deficit in processing speed. And you could see that that's the problem. That's why they don't seem like they're smart in class. It's definitely, you can see it so clearly. They're they're able to do mazes and they're able to understand, you know, spatial thinking and, and vocabulary and all these different kinds of things really, really well in math. But they, they just are, they need a little more time. And that's where, you know, something like even giving a kid more time on a test or, um, you know, making accommodations can be really helpful. So I really appreciate your point about all of these different kinds of executive functioning that we need to get exactly. educated on. <laughs> you know, there's an article, if anyone wants to download and show it to a teacher, there's an article on my website called How Fast is Smart. Oh, yeah, that's great. How Fast great. is Smart. And it's all about that whole idea of raising the hand and what we can do differently. Because I think if that's one big change we can make for kids, I think that would be awesome. Awesome. So they don't walk around from kindergarten on thinking they're not smart enough because they're not fast enough. Yeah, because what a, what a disappointment. I mean, that's just miserable if, if we are yeah. raising kids to think that when it's just not true. And yeah. so I appreciate that. So that's on your website, which again is ptscoaching.com. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. sure. All right. And um, one more executive function would sure. be um, action, which is monitoring yourself in action. Mm -hmm. That's self-talk. And self-talk, remember, is a developmental skill. We assume the kids are talking themselves th through all these conversations like we are, that, that guide you toward your goals. They're not. Mm. It's a developmental skill. But the way we can help kids develop their internal self-talk is by asking them questions mm. and, and talking our own lives out loud, like talking to them about how to, you know, I don't know, I, I'm cooking dinner tonight, and gee, I'm making chicken. I wonder how long I need to cook the chicken for. I better start at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, right? right Rather right. than just putting dinner on the table. Let them see your internal conversations more. Well, that's a great that's tip. It. You know, just to, you're planning out loud, essentially, right? You're planning, exactly. you're sharing what you're normally just thinking, the steps that you're taking that you're right. We just take for granted and think, well, other people must know this, and our children obviously are going to learn this, but... Um, I think your point's really important. So parents, everybody listening, try that out at home. That's something easy to do. Just start asking questions or talking about it or, hey, what do you think I should do? This is what I want to do, want to happen. So what do you think I need to do to get there? Something like that, right? Exactly. But as you can see, I think already, just these basic things, just having an education to me is your first key. It's yeah. the most important thing you could do. Right. And, and that edu and that education can come in many ways by reading great books like yours, by, you know, seeking out help from therapy or coaching, by going to a course like yours, by searching online. Yeah. I mean, wherever it begins, um, mm -hmm. the, the point is to get educated about ADHD, what it means, what's really happening with your child so that you can then develop the skills that you need to help them. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things that we always say is it's think of an iceberg. And at the tip of the top of the iceberg is what you see. You mm -hmm. see the inattentiveness, the hyperactivity, the impulsivity, but it's everything underneath that mm -hmm. is involved with the ADHD that is really what's causing the problems. And, and the, other, the other big area I'll mention is emotional regulation. And emotional regulation is an executive function skill, but I will say that it is at the core of ADHD. That is the area that has parents up at night yes. and drive yes. everyone crazy. Because your emotional regulation, that's your ability to manage your frustration, your impatience, all of that, your experience, and being able to stay toward your goal. Right. So can you just give a brief example of, let's say, a child that is ha has poor emotional regulation? What does that look like? Sure. So the kid who has poor re emotional regulation, they may hear no, and rather than being able to sort of slow down and process it and see what does that mean, or maybe even say, but mom, you know, what if we do it this way, or, you know, this is really important to me, they may just, you know, be zero to 100. They just can't handle it. Yeah. They may just totally melt down. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the reason my course is called Calm and Connected is because these are kids who don't have the ability very often to self-regulate. They can't calm themselves down. So when we say to kids, well, you just calm down and then, you know, everything will be fine. <laughs> that's just repeating our expectation. That's not a strategy. We need to give <laughs> kids strategies and support to help them calm down. That's a great point. <laughs> it's not a strategy to keep repeating yourself over and over and saying, just be quiet or calm down. Or, and especially because it's probably making you less and less calm the more you repeat it, right? So, Exactly. And that oh, leads, exactly. When I teach parents about calm, I say, you know what, guys? It's got to start with you. That's right. <laughs> we have to start with you being able to calm yourself down, which is where, you know, I know one of the other eight keys books is all about mindfulness. Yes. It's all yeah. about, like, what you can do to center yourself and ground yourself. And and that's that leads us right into key two, which is create calm. And, you know, mm -hmm. one thing that you wrote in here is calm is your power. I love yeah. that. I think I want to put that on my wall. You know, calm is your well, power. You remind me, I will send you a magnet and I make that offer to your parents as well. I literally have magnets that I give out in my workshop that say calm is power. And oh, I tell I parents, I don't care if you put it on the refrigerator or on your bathroom or in your, you know, underwear drawer, you've got to <laughs> keep it there so you remember. Because if you think about it, when we're stressed out, yeah. we can't think. We can't learn, we can't process, we can't problem solve. So we have to start with calm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you, like you said, it has to start with us. It can't be us being all frazzled trying to tell our kid to calm down and be calm, right? We have to kind of be the models and create that environment as well. So what would you exactly. say is like a, a good starting place for moms who are trying to create calm in their, their life or their child's life? Well, that's two different questions. So for the moms, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I would literally, I start with breathing. And I mean, I'm a big supporter of mindfulness and meditation, but even if you don't engage in all of that, literally just take a few seconds and just you realize that was three seconds, maybe five seconds. And that can make all the difference because that's the difference between reacting and thinking and acting. Mm. So the first thing I would say is just slow down, sit down, say, you know what, honey, I'll answer you in a second. Let me just breathe for a second. Mm. So that's the first Great thing advice. I would say. Yeah. And then for and kids. Well, we can also teach the kids the to, to do the same thing as well, right? Absolutely. We yeah. can teach the kids the same thing. And one other thing I would add is, and in my book, I talk about help them develop a calm kit. Literally, for especially for the young kids, help them have like a pouch that has things in there, whether it's a squeeze ball or a deck of cards or a coloring book or something that they could do so they can break that circuit of stress. Hmm. You no, know? and let's just let's calm down. And I promise, as soon as we calm down, we can talk about whatever it was that was upsetting us. We hmm. can talk about that problem we're having or that decision you wanted or whatever else it is. But let's just let's just calm down first. I love that idea. And I'm totally going to use that because I have, you know, one of my children struggles with anxiety and worry and fear. And, 
you know, and there have been a lot of lockdowns at school because of, you know, false threats and things that are just freaking her out. But, you know, what mm -hmm. a great idea to have a calm kit that you can take with you to school, that you can have with you at home, that can help you to, like you said, break the those that cycle that goes on in your head and that so i think it that could work for all kinds of things that our kids and we might struggle with right and you know for the older kids and the teenagers who of course aren't going to want to have this nice little kit it can be a virtual kit it can mm. even be just a mm -hmm. list that they keep laminated in you know or on their phone or something these mm. are things i can do mm. to calm down i can run around the block i can do push-ups with my hands i can do jumping jacks i can breathe i can you know whatever it is for that person I love it. I love it. That's a great that's tip. Good. And that's just, that goes for everybody out there. I don't care whether yeah, you have absolutely. ADHD or not. Everybody <laughs> needs calm, right? Create that's calm. Cool. And we have to start with ourselves. I love it. And I think I'm, I'm definitely going to take you up on that offer to get a magnet. And anybody else listening, that's, what's your email again? Yeah. You said people can email you, right? I email Cindy, C-I-N-D-Y at P-T-S coaching. And that stands for Pathways to Success because I really believe these kids their, their pathway isn't like that. It's it's sort of like that. Yeah. So it's, it's Cindy at PTS. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. All right. So let's move on to key three, which is strength and connection. Yeah. So yeah. how can we start with that one? Absolutely. Well, you know what? I really believe that without a loving bond between parents and child, we can't be there to help them. Mm -hmm. If we are like this, we're not able to help them. So literally one of the things I have parents work on is connection. And one of the best ways to do that, and I know this sounds crazy, especially if you have a teenager, is literally carving out time together. Mm. Because without quality time, and I say this in the book, you know that, without quality time, there is no, without, I'm sorry, without quantity time, there is no quality time. Oh, that's so good. So I have so parents schedule 20 minutes a day, maybe three days a week, you know, every week for several weeks. And yes, even if you have a teenager, and even if that teenager doesn't want to spend the time with you, what you may want to do is just sort of, you know, hang out with them, just sort of see what they're doing. Just sort of say, hey, you know, can I, you know, can we just go out for some ice cream? Yeah. It doesn't have to be this yeah. big thing, but the important thing about this time together, it can't be about errands, and it can't be about teaching your child something. It really has to be child-centered time. Yeah. What does your child yeah. want to do? What's an activity that they feel good about? If you have a kid who's always playing video games and you feel like, oh, they're never going to spend time with me. They just want to be on those video games. Ask them to teach you. Mm -hmm. Most parents mm -hmm. I know, they say, oh, I, I don't know what my kid likes about those games. I don't know anything about them. Well, get to know it. You know, think of it. That's their interest. Join their world. Mm -hmm. That connection is so valuable. Oh, so true. And I love, I love that, what you just said, join their world. And I, yeah. I'm a total proponent of, you know, getting involved with your kids. And I want to just plug here, too, that if you can get them active with you in whatever way they like, yes. all exercise. the better, right? Exercise for mental health. You know, one of my keys is exercise as a family. And it does, you know, exercise and activity. I want to just say physical activity, not just exercise, but doing fun activities with your kids that they want to do. Play, you know, mm -hmm. I have... Right now, of my six kids, four or five of them are teenagers. <laughs> so I'm totally in the teenager mode. And of my boys, you know, none of them will talk to me unless we're doing something like playing a sport together or doing some kind yeah. of activity. And then all of a sudden they'll open up. So yeah, get active with your kids. And that has the added benefit of them being active, which also improves mental clarity and focus and executive functioning and all that stuff too. Oh, so absolutely. All the better, right? Awesome. Okay. And you know, I just, I do also want to, I just loved these, um, the three ends for effective praise, the formula for effective praise, the three ends, notice, name, and nourish. We talk a little bit about that. I think that's just a great tip for parents and moms listening out there. Absolutely. So I always say that it's important when we praise our kids that we, first of all, you want to make it about them and not about you. It's not about, I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that they Imagine this, you want to see those peacock feathers, like really opening up on them. You want to see them feeling really proud, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you need to notice what they're doing, and then you need to name what you noticed, and then you need to say something warm. So for instance, um, you know, Sally, I, I see that you saw Johnny's books fall, and you went and helped them pick them up. That was really sweet of you, mm. right? Rather than just, you know, saying, oh, nice. <laughs> or what we very often do parents is when we see our kids playing so nicely, what do we do? 
oh, I can go make a phone call. Yes. Right? We ignore I, it. I, yeah. 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 Let sleeping dogs lie sort of thing. Right. So we want to let them know what we notice. That's And that also goes to the connection. Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing is we're saying, hey, I notice you. I notice you as this positive kid. Because what the research has shown, interestingly, is especially when you have families where there's a lot of defiance, a lot of yelling and anger and all this, that parents actually spend less time commenting and noticing the good stuff, even when that good behavior exists. Because hmm. they're so focused on the negative. Yeah. yeah so can I, I give you a tip on that? Yeah, please. I love tips. Okay. I so tips. I suggest um, take 20 pennies at the beginning of the day. Put 10 pennies in each pocket. And every time you have to reprimand your child, even if you're saying it nicely and, and appropriately, hey, you forgot to, you know, you forgot your books, take a penny and put it in the left pocket. But every time you praise your child, take a penny and put it in the right pocket. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, see how that counting is? Mm -hmm. And then add in all the negative messages your child gets all day long from school, from their friends, from just themselves, of all the things they've forgotten and didn't do and you know, expectations they didn't meet, you'll realize how much more you need to do the positive to just give them an equal balance. Oh, what a great tip. I'm so glad you shared that. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. do that, but I'm going to need more than 10 pennies because I got a lot of kids. So, I... <laughs> but you're right. They get so <laughs> much. Carpenter pants that has yeah. all the different pants. Cargo pants, that. right? Exactly. <laughs> But I, I love that because then you can take stock of what you're doing and really take ownership as a parent of what we're really doing. Because I think we do. We don't pay attention to. I know. I know that's something I'm trying to work on more this year. You know, I'm trying to focus on what I say to people and how I'm how loving I'm being or not. Um, and with my kids, especially because it is it's so easy for us to just tune out. And especially, like you said, when they're doing well, it's sort of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So. You know, it's easy to right. ignore the kids that are actually doing the best and instead of to encourage mm -hmm. and, imp and praise what they're doing, right? So that's a great yeah. tip. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so key four is cultivate good communication. Communication is so key. <laughs> it really is. And, you know, anyone who's taken a Psych 101 class, and many of us did this in college or just, <laughs> you know, read some magazines, whether it's Oprah or whatever else, mm -hmm. you know that communication, it's all about making the person feel heard. Mm -hmm. And what I have found is I encourage parents to teach their kids, but I'll tell you a secret. Part of what I'm doing is I'm asking parents to kind of work with each other differently too. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. I always tell parents I don't do couples therapy, but I do do couples coaching. The ability to hear the other person and let them feel that you hear them is so valuable. So I'm a big proponent of teaching kids what communication really looks like. That to be to let someone know you hear them, you sometimes want to just reflect back what you've heard. So is this what you're saying? Do I have that right? And then give the person the opportunity to say, no, that's not what I mean. Yeah. Okay, well, let me understand. And you'll see that can really relax someone. Hmm. So that's just one piece of it, but that's that's where it starts. That's a great tip too, and I know that that act, that active and reflective listening is so valuable, and it goes beyond. Yeah. You know, you're reminding me of my husband who will we'll be talking, or he'll and he'll be like half asleep or something, and I'll say, "Did you hear me?" And he'll repeat back exactly what I just said, the last sentence, and it doesn't uh -huh. prove anything to me because it doesn't. You know, it's like he could hear that even right. when he's half asleep, but it doesn't mean that he really understood what it, what I was saying. So, you know, That's taking right. that extra step to understand and to communicate, this is what I'm hearing and is this right kind of thing, right? Exactly. It can't just be the reflecting. It has to be the validating yeah. and then the empathizing. Mm. So I can imagine that that makes you feel X, Y, and Z. Is mm -hmm. that right? And then again, give them the opportunity to say, no, that's not, that's not how I'm feeling mm -hmm. because now you're really communicating. Yeah. And when you yeah, do I that, go for it. I was just going to say, I teach a lot of other details in the book where I talk about like using a timer and say, you know, passing around a stick, all these things just to really facilitate real conversation. Right. And then what I was going to add to that is that when we do that, we teach, we're setting our kids up for so much better success in their relationships later on, right? I mean, this is the hugest block to, to marriage and to all kinds of intimate relationships and to friendships and everything. So when we're doing this with our kids, they're picking it up too, and they're learning these skills that they can then use down the road. Exactly. In fact, it's interesting. I was just listening to Dan Goldman, who wrote the landmark book on emotional, I, I, I guess, emotional quotient or basically emotional yeah. intelligence. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
And, you know, I was having this conversation with some people about the fact that it's that, that ability to have that emotional relationship and that true connection that helps you move forward in life. You could have all the book smart in the world, but if you can't interact with people, you can only go so far. Yeah. So that's right. Communication that's skills right. are just so important. And and again, pointing back to your book and, and your resources and your workshop to, to learn more about how to improve that communication because it is such an important topic. We could have a whole show on that and we probably need to have a whole show on that soon. <laughs> we could do that. Um, so key five, teach collaboration. Yeah. So collaboration. Collaboration is really about hearing the other person's needs as valuable as yours. Mm. So rather than a top-down parenting approach where I'm making the rules and you just got to follow it, the reality is, yeah, it is important. Parents do need to have the bottom line that, you know, we are setting the stage. But especially as your child is getting older, and I hate to say this, especially if you have a child with ADHD who very often they are very strong-willed kids, yeah. which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it is challenging, okay? <laughs> so when you've got a strong-willed child who doesn't just accept you know, no or anything, the more you do this top down, the more they fight back up. So you're much better off learning, and this is why the communication key is before the collaboration key, really learning to understand their concern and help them express their concern and then express your concern so now we can have a conversation. We could say, well, what do you think we could do about, you know, it sounds like you're wanting a later bedtime and I'm concerned about you being up in the morning and being alert and everything else. What do you think we could do to solve this? And then letting the kid brainstorm some of the ideas before you even start that because their ideas, they're probably going to be more attached to anyway. Mm. And, you know, we want to help them develop, again, those executive functions, those abilities to think about what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. So that's in a nutshell what collaboration is about. Right. And, and I think you're right. I think it... Whether it's your child with ADHD or your spouse or partner, it always works better to come from that. We're in a team. We're a team. We're doing this together. We're both working on this, and I think it, that's a really helpful skill to teach your children as well, as well as to learn ourselves. <laughs> it's not always easy oh, yeah. as a parent. You just want to be in charge of which, everything. That's right. Which is why I go back to that. Calm is the foundation of all of this because when we're not calm and we're doing this. Yeah. We're not going to collaborate. Yeah. We need to really yeah. calm down and breathe and say, okay, you know what? Hey, we love each other. We're just disagreeing. We want to sit on the same side of the couch and look at the problem over there. What's your concern? Mm -hmm. You know, let me share mm -hmm. my concern. Let's talk about this. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so key six is be clear and consistent. Now, these are, to me, some really important parenting tools all around. And to me, consistency is like one of the top, if not the top, parenting um you know, rule that we need to follow. We need to be consistent. Right, so right. talk a little but bit here's about the what that caveat. But here's the caveat that in this. Uh -huh. And I haven't really really mentioned that that at, in the introduction of my book, um, I talk about my philosophy, which is parent the child you have. Mm -hmm. Not the child you thought you'd have, not the child you wish you'd have, not the child you'd have if your mother in law got her way and you parented the way, you know, she wanted <laughs> you to. Yes. Right? So at the core of this, we have to know our child. And once we know our child, our consistency might be different for this child than for this child mm. because we really understand who that child is. And one of the things I say is don't bend the universe too much. And by bend the universe, I mean is listen, you know what? If punching someone is a capital offense outside of the real world, you know, if you, can, if you could get in trouble, not a capital offense, but if you could get in trouble for punching someone, well, you need to get in tr trouble, you know, punching someone in your own house too. But parent the child you have, you have to balance that with don't bend the universe too much. The punishment you may have for the child who you know at the core of this, he's just so frustrated and he he's, doesn't have the skills in the moment to do anything differently and he realizes afterwards he's really remorseful and he really wants to work things out. You don't have to have that you know big consequence because hey, he just punched someone. You can work things out. Mm -hmm. Right? So... Yeah. That's why yeah. clarity and consistency are vital, but it has to be balanced with the child that you have. 
Yes. And I, yes. you know, I just have to echo that having six different children, they are so different and you do have to really respect their individuality and what they need. And a lot of times that involves for me explaining to the other child why it seems to them that I'm treating this child different than this child. It's like, well, this child responds to this and you're not responding to this, you know, and I think that can be tough for children to learn sometimes too, but we do have to be um, be able to identify their specific needs and be clear and consistent. Great advice. Yes. All right, two and more Rick, keys here. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just going to no. say Rick Lavoie, um, for those of you who know him, he's, he's a wonderful writer and orator. He says, fair is not equal. Fair is giving everyone what they need. Oh, I love it. I'm going to put that on my fridge too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a great quote. Giving everyone what they need. I love it. Perfect. Okay, so our last, the last two keys we'll just touch on real quick before we wrap up. So key seven is establish meaningful consequences. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm just going to say it simply this way. When I do my workshop, consequences literally is session six out of seven sessions. And the reason is before you can give an effective consequence, you need to be calm so you're not reacting. You need to have a connected relationship so your child realizes you really are, are on their side. You're just maybe disagreeing in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. You need to be able to communicate appropriately. You need to be able to collaborate so that we're really understanding what the issues are, what the concerns are. You need to have your rules, your expectations, which means you need to have the clarity and the consistency. And then you're ready to start talking about consequences. So if you're thinking about consequences, make sure you've done all those things first. <laughs> okay, I can't agree more. When I teach parenting, <laughs> I always teach discipline last for the same reasons. Because everybody yep. wants to know, how do I discipline my kid? But really, first we need the self-discipline for ourselves, right? That's really what uh you're saying. And learning all those skills. And then we can give the appropriate consequence. That's right. Ah, oh, love That's it. Right. All right. And key eight, choices, yours mm -hmm. and theirs. It all comes back to our choices, right? <laughs> it does. Mm -hmm. And what I'll say about that is once you have effective consequences, really what you're doing is you're helping the child proactively make a decision. Mm -hmm. You're allowing them to be disciplined enough to say, okay, I know that if I stay out after my curfew, this is what's going to happen. Am I willing to make that choice? Am I willing to do that trade-off? So choices really comes down to helping your child know what it is that they're, you know, what their options are and what they're choosing to do. Mm. So at the core of all of this, we want to help them pause and reflect, right? Think about what they're doing before they do it and then make a good choice. Yeah. So that's why that's yeah. the last thing we can do because at the beginning, you know, I have, I think I have it in the book. I know I have it in my workshop. There's a cartoon that I show and it's basically a lawyer and a person, you know, with a contract in front of him. And it says, sign here to say that you have absolutely no idea what you're signing. <laughs> right? And, yeah. the, and the whole idea is it. that, you know, kids need to know what they're getting themselves into so that they can make good choices. Yeah. And that's really what it's all about. I mean, all of this that we're talking about today, it's about helping us make good choices so we can help our children make good choices, especially the ones who are struggling with ADHD. Yeah. That's right. Cindy, thank you so much for being here. And I've learned a lot from you today. I really appreciate it. And I hope that everybody out there listening will go to your website. That is, again, PTS Coaching. And tell me what PTS means again. Pathways to Success. That's right. Pathways to Success. So PTSCoaching.com. You can also email Cindy, as she said, C-I-N-D-Y at yeah. PTSCoaching.com. And... Do you just want to say that my workshop that we've mentioned, my next session is coming up May 5th. Awesome. And I do it in person on Long Island, but I also do it as a live webinar across the country, across the world. So if anyone is interested, you can email me or you can look on my website for the Common Connected Workshop and you can participate. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know you did it online. That's a wonderful resource. And I imagine... It's actually a live webinar, just like we're doing this. Great. So, so people can watch it live. And and I imagine that even, even if someone listens to this down the road, that there will be more, you'll do more sessions and keep them coming, Absolutely. Right? I'm always repeating it. Awesome. Absolutely. And be sure to check out Cindy's book, Eight Keys to Parenting Children with ADHD. And again, you can find that through her website. And also you can find her book and my Eight Keys book, Eight Keys to Mental Health Through Exercise on Norton.com in their mental health series as well. 
And for those <laughs> watching the video, you can see the cover right now. Eight keys to parenting children with ADHD. She was just holding it up. So um, thanks again, Cindy. And to all of you out there um, who are listening and tune in every week, this is why we do this show, you know, to get to learn and to grow together because it's a lot better to do it together and to do it each week as we do here on Motherhood. And I will see you all next time. Bye-bye, everybody.